Today's reading is taken from John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verses 1 to 20. It is in your bulletins. John chapter 13, verse 1. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now when it was time for supper, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God and that he was going back to God. So he got up from supper, laid aside his outer clothing, took a towel and tied it around himself. Next, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I'm doing you don't realize now, but afterward you will understand. You will never wash my feet, Peter said. Jesus replied, If I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. One who has bathed, Jesus told him, doesn't need to wash anything except his feet, but he is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. This is why he said, not all of you are clean. When Jesus had washed their feet, and put on his outer clothing, he reclined again and said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are speaking rightly, since that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, so that you should uh, do just as I have done for you. Truly I tell you, a servant is not greater than his master, and a messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I'm not speaking about all of you. I know those I have chosen, but the scripture must be fulfilled. The one who eats my bread has raised his heel against me. I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. Truly I tell you, whoever receives anyone I send receives me, and the one who receives me receives him who sent me. The word of God. <laughs> Amen. Well, let me introduce myself. I had intended to do that earlier and got distracted. So if you're new with us today, my name is Blaine Boyd, and I have the privilege of being one of the elders here at Redeemer Fellowship of Kuwait. And uh, we're certainly glad and, and, and thrilled that you have come to, to worship the Lord with us this morning uh, and to sit under his word and, and to learn by and be changed by his word. Speaking of change, then how does one go about changing the way someone has related to the world for decades. Like actually teaching them something new. In the U.S. we may call it teaching an old dog new tricks. Like when we have a, a particular way that we understand the world to be and a, a particular way that we relate to and interact with that world, how is it that one would go about completely undoing decades of learning and, and teaching a new way. I think of when my parents, I, I got married to, to Kelly, and uh, she's ethnically Japanese, and so uh, Japanese eat with chopsticks, right? Well, my parents um, are as, like, as white, as American, as white American can be. They'd never even had Japanese food before, and so we got together one time, and we we're going to have sushi with my parents before the wedding, and of course, in a culturally appropriate thing, we asked them to use chopsticks. Now, for decade upon decade upon decade, my parents have only eaten with a fork, and, and so watching them try to pick up these chopsticks 
and, and try to eat with that. Now, now, what was the likelihood if I would have just said, no, 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 mom, you, you, you hold it and you have your index finger and you place it here on the index, you're like, it would have been absolutely useless, right? No, no, what do we do? It just instinctually, how did we try to show them to use chopsticks? We, we picked up chopsticks and held them and, and modeled it for them. We said, hey, here, this is, this is how you, we showed them how to do it. Now, they didn't learn very well, but, but the idea is that, that a, a key to learning and a key to learning new things and a is actually having it modeled for you. And, and that's actually what we're seeing Jesus do in our text today. He's, he's coming before his disciples who have lived and interacted with the world in a particular way that, that all their instincts, all their experience told them the world was one way and that they should interact with that world in that one way. And what Jesus is saying, that's not true. I need you to try something new. As my disciples, you're going to, you're going to do something different. You're going to eat with, okay, they're not going to eat with chopsticks, but, but you're going to have to learn how to live and interact with this world now as my people. And he doesn't just tell them, but he actually models it for them. That he gives them an object lesson to show them what it means and how they are now to interact with one another and the world before them. And, and so for us, it's, a, it's a good to see him modeling. He's modeling it for them, but he's also, in the, in the story in his word, he's, he's modeling what it is for us to now live as Jesus' people in this world. And it's important that we, we recognize, as, as Mitchell showed us last week, that we're making a transition here. That last week was kind of the, the, the transition. Now we're into a new section within the Gospel of John. So up until chapter 12, most of what Jesus was doing was speaking to the crowds, speaking to the Jews who were there, assessing him and trying to decide who this person was. Is this the Messiah? And he was calling them to believe and follow him. And now, in verses 13 and 14 and 15 and 16 and 17, he's now moved away from the crowds and he's sitting with his disciples, the, the 12 that had been with them, and, and really the 11, because Judas is about to, to go do his things. So he's really speaking to the 11 people who are his disciples, his followers, the, those who are truly believing in them. And, and now he's speaking to them, the church, and saying, hey, as my people, this is now how you live and interact. I'm getting ready to leave, but you're going to stay. And as my representatives here in this world, this is the way that you are going to live and interact. I'm going to teach you a new way, and, and that new way is humble service. The new way of Jesus that he's going to teach, that we're going to see in this foot-washing story, in this foot-washing example, is the way of humble service. And what Jesus does is he comes and he humbly serves so that his people will go and humbly serve. We are humbly served to humbly serve. You know, so what, what Jesus models for us, then he calls us to go do as well, which is humble service. And the context of this teaching, the object lesson, so to speak, is foot washing. It's foot washing. I'm, I'm sure that as we came in today, everyone shared in washing each other's feet. Okay, maybe not, maybe you're not familiar with foot washing. So let's, let me set the context for foot washing and, and how his disciples would have understood and been receiving this. Because it's not, it's not a common thing for people to be washing one another's feet uh, in today's age. Very few cultures are washing one another's feet. Some cultures, even a lot of the cultures around us, will wash their own feet, but, but very rarely will we wash one another's feet. So, so what's going on here with Jesus? Clearly, we see that he comes along and, and washes his feet. And that, that is, that's the context of what's going on, right? So let's just see, in, in the passage, what we see is that Jesus, during supper... Verse 4, he got up from supper, he laid aside his outer clothing, he took a towel, he tied it around himself, and next he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and dry them with the towel tied around him. 
Now, that, that idea of, of coming, bringing a basin of water, washing the feet and drying them, that itself would not have been an unusual practice in first century Palestine, first century Judea. That it was very common for when people came into a home for someone to wash their feet. Which in some ways makes sense, right? And, and now we can overdo the dirtiness of feet in, in first century Palestine. Now, you may have heard this where, if you heard this preach where, where it sounds like that the disciples were out running around just like jumping in animal feces and getting as dirty, as stinky as possible and then coming in uh, as a way of elevating Christ's lowly, you know, lowly humility to us. Um, and, and some of that is true, but some of it gets exaggerated. The reality is that people were walking around in a dusty place where there was some animal feces on the grounds where they walked, um, but they were also walking in sandals. It's not like their feet were just completely caked with dirt and mud. But one of the ways that a host showed hospitality to a guest that came into their home was to have one of their servants come, and when they entered the home, to have that servant, or if they didn't maybe have servant, it would be one of the younger members of the family possibly, would wash the, the feet of the guest as a show of welcome, as a show of, of hospitality and of concern for the neighbor. And so, so they would come in and get the, the feet washed. So the very fact... That Jesus, the very fact that foot washing is going on here is not shocking. That would have been a very familiar process to the disciples. But what's shocking is the when and the who. What was shocking about the, the, the story of the foot washing in John 13 is the when it took place and the who was doing it. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't if you're going to foot wash, if you're, if you're a host and you're welcoming people into your home and you want to be hospitable to them. The foot washing would happen at the, when they first entered. It, it would be a way of greeting. It would be a way of welcoming in. You'd, you'd, the, the dirt was on the outside. We're, we're cleaning you up so you can come in and be with us. And so the fact that it was during supper, that the, 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 the disciples were already there, they were already enjoying a time together, and then mid-supper, Jesus stands up and goes and does this foot washing, would have been surprising. And, and what that really tells us is, I'm doing this, not just as a show of hospitality, which we can see that there's hospitality and humility in it, but I'm doing this to make a, a point. Like the reason I'm doing this in the middle of the supper is this is important. I want you guys to take notice of this. I'm teaching you something in this, and we're going to look at that teaching. But more importantly, the, the shock of is not necessarily the, the when the foot washing took place, but the who was doing the foot washing. You see, like some of the, the societies we probably come from, the cultures we come from, in, in first century Roman culture, first century Jewish culture, was a very layered or stratified culture. But that, that means there's, there's a sense of a hierarchy, and everyone had their place in that hierarchy. And, and so whether you're a Jew or, or a Gentile, whether you're a man or, or a woman, whether you're a master or a, a servant, whether you were rich or whether you were poor, like you knew where you fit within that, that layer that stratified that hierarchy of a, a society. And what's really clear is that those who are at the top of that layered society do not stoop down to serve those who are at the bottom of that society. That the, the unwritten rules of that culture and and maybe cultures like where you come from say that those are at the top of the culture. Do not stoop down and serve and humble themselves to the lowest of that society. Which is exactly what Jesus does. The one who we've seen has been declared and recognized as the new king of Israel is at the top of society. That there's no one that's greater than the God king Jesus Christ. That there's no one greater on that, that, that layers of society and culture than Jesus. Yet, yet he flips that whole society on its head. And he stoops down and does the work of a slave or of a servant or of a nobody. Right? He looks at society's structures and the way that we order and the way that we interact with the world and he completely demolishes it. It would have been shocking 
possibly even offensive as we see in Peter's response, what he did. And what he's doing is he's undoing these false structures. And he's saying, I'm at the very top. I'm the master. I am the king. Yet I am going to humbly serve you. And he's going to be doing two things in showing his humble service. We're going to see two real lessons. These are the two main points of the passage, the two main points of our sermon today. As he's teaching us two things from this humble service, this, this coming down from the top of society and, and acting himself and serving humbly as a servant. The first thing we're going to see, the first thing we're going to see is that Jesus' foot washing, this is the first lesson that Jesus' foot washing is symbolizing. It symbolizes our cleansing at the cross. He's teaching us something in the coming down of our salvation, what he's getting ready to do at the cross. So that's the first thing. Jesus' foot washing symbolizes our cleansing at the cross. And the second thing is that Jesus' foot washing models our call to humble service. That Jesus' foot washing models our call to humble service. The two things are related, but there's also some difference. And we're going to be looking at that. There's these two different understandings and teachings from this. And the first one we see in verses 6 through 11. So as Jesus is going around and he's, he's cleaning these feet, he, he comes to this conversation with Peter where he actually shows a lot of what is going on. Why am I doing this? What is, what is this foot washing meaning to you? We see that in this, this conversation. And this is an important conversation because one of the dangers that we can make in reading this foot washing passage is believing that the problem is just um, that we need to be educated. That, that we actually, the, the problem with humanity is we just don't know how to relate to the world. And so if we could just educate ourselves, and Jesus so nicely models what it's like to live in this world, then, then everything would be okay. But the problem with that is it neglects the idea that we have sinful, broken, blemished, hard hearts. And so an effort to just go around and educate people isn't going to fix any of the problems in us or in the world. And so Jesus starts his conversation by, by not mentioning the education bit and the modeling, but, but showing forth what actually needs to be done to us if we're going to follow him in obedience. And that is that we need to be cleansed. Now this, this conversation with Peter that we're getting ready to jump into we have to hear it. We have to hear this conversation within the background, kind of the cross. The, the whole act of, of Christ dying and, and raising again and ascending. Like, that's the, what's going on. Have you ever seen those movies where you have, like, one scene in the foreground, and maybe there's a conversation going on, uh, maybe someone's talking about a flashback or something like that, and in the background you have a separate scene going on, which is depicting what they're talking about. Well, that's kind of how we have to see John 13, is that in the foreground, what we're seeing is Jesus washing feet and having a conversation with Peter and a conversation with the disciples. In the background, what's going on is the cross. And so we understand what's going on in the foreground by also seeing to the cross, which is imminent. And we know that because of everything we've seen, all of chapter 11 and 12 driving us toward and recognize the impending, imminent death of Jesus on the cross. He starts the passage, John does, by the recognition that Jesus is about to go to the Father. He's about to depart. His time is coming. Verse 1, the hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Jesus' work of dying, rising, and ascending is almost finished. Verse 3, the very same thing. Jesus knew the Father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God, and that he was going back to God. The moment of the passion and the resurrection is near. And so this foot washing has that in the background. We also have the, the theme that runs through our passage today of Judas, which we'll talk about him later, but Judas' own betrayal. And it's Judas' betrayal that, that put the ball in motion, so to speak, that led us to the cross. And so, so with all this going on, we, we can't see the foot washing without thinking about the cross. And Jesus is going to make that clear. And Jesus tells us three things. There's three things about the foot washing and, and how they relate to the cleansing of the cross that we need to see 
from this passage. That, that first of all, as we think about the foot washing representing Jesus' work on the cross, we see that Jesus' cleansing work is necessary. Jesus' cleansing work is necessary. So, so he's washing feet. He came to Simon Peter, verse 6, and Simon asked, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? He's recognizing how, how countercultural, how wrong this is. Everything they have learned is the master, the teacher, the king does not wash the, the feet of his followers. This is messed up. Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus answers, what I'm doing, you don't realize now, but afterward you will, will understand. So probably pointing forward, like I'm not, you're not going to understand the nature of this act and the symbolism of this act until after the cross. That's when it's going to come. That's when you're going to go, oh, Jesus, that's what you were doing. And so then Peter again, in his bold but ignorant self, says, you will never, you will never wash my feet. Trying to be honorable, trying to, to honor Jesus. And Jesus replies with a, a gentle rebuke of, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. If I, Jesus, don't wash you, Peter, if I, Jesus, don't wash you, brother and sister of Redeemer Fellowship, if, if I, Jesus, don't wash you, Christian, you have no part in me. He's not talking about foot washing here, right? He's not talking about yet to have clean feet. What he's saying is, if I don't do the work of the cross of cleansing you from your sin, making that sacrifice, Official death on your behalf through my blood cleaning you, you have no part with me. To have a part and a share in the inheritance of God for his children, we must first be cleaned by Christ. Not the washing just of our feet, but the, the cleansing of our sin. It's the promise that God made in Ezekiel 36 that it's actually God who's going to clean his people. It's God who's going to cleanse us from our impropriety and our sinfulness. That's what Jesus was doing at the cross. You see, no part in me or no share in me, that's, that's language of inheritance. That, that God has an eternal inheritance waiting for his people and for his children and but the way that we actually access that is that we come clean. You know, I don't know, I don't know about law and how wills and last testaments work where, where you're from, but in the United States, when someone makes a will, they can, they can put everything in there, and then they can, put, they can put clauses that say, hey, if you do this or don't do that, then you lose your inheritance. That if there's someone that's like, I, if you get married, then you don't get it, or if you don't get married, you get it, or, you know, whatever you want, and and so there, there is a clause on the last will and testament. Of course, he doesn't go. But there's a clause on the inheritance of God, the, the eternal inheritance that, that is offered to us in Jesus Christ. There is a clause on our receiving that inheritance that says we must be clean. That we cannot go and take part in God's eternal inheritance with a blemished and sinful heart. That we can only come as one who is clean. And here's the trick, though. We can't clean ourselves. The whole story of the Bible is people who are trying to clean themselves and they can't do it. How does one get clean? It's by Jesus. I was uh, thinking about, as I even think about cleaning myself, I was thinking about our, our son, Camden. He's two years old. And it's always nice to be compared to a two-year-old. But, um, but he's, he's two years old and, and he loves like yogurt curd. And so he eats it all the time, and he gets big old spoonfuls of it, and he just drops it everywhere. And he's getting to that age where he actually wants to, like, clean it himself sometimes. And so he, he'll get it, like, there'll be a big old clump of, of curd on himself or something. He'll just, like, get the tissue and just rub it all over. And he's like, and, and all he does, right, all he does is he makes it worse. A big old curd hits the, the table, and he'll, oh, I'll clean it up. And he just, all, all he did is take it from a lump there and just spread it all over this curd everywhere, right? All he does when he attempts to clean himself is make himself messier. And, and, and brothers and sisters, when we try to clean ourselves, to make ourselves clean and appropriate before God, all we do is make ourselves messier. 
We are wholly unable. We are, can't, we are the two-year-old trying to clean curd off of ourselves when we try to wash away our own sinfulness. If, if nothing else, all we are doing is screaming our pride, making a, a claim to God that I'm actually able to clean myself, which is a failure to recognize our own dirty state. There's only one, there's only one who can clean us, and that's Jesus Christ. There's only one who can clean us. Jesus' cleansing work is necessary for us to receive eternal life. The second thing, the second thing we see about the symbolism and the cleansing here is that Jesus' cleaning work is final and complete. So Peter, as he's want to jump for extremes, he, he goes, okay, you have no part of me, Jesus says. So in verse 9, Peter responds, okay, fine, not just my feet. Do it all. Do my hands. Do my head. Now, it's quite possibly that what, what Peter is looking at here is this idea of ritual cleaning, that, that the primary things that Jewish people would clean to be considered ritually clean uh, is the hands, the feet, and, and the head. Now, it doesn't say that specifically, but maybe that's what he had in mind. But, but either way, what Peter's saying is just like, get me clean, do it all. Dude, don't, just, don't just do it with the feet, like, like take care of me fully. And what does Jesus say? He says, hey, the one who has bathed or been washed, Jesus told him, doesn't need to wash anything except his feet, but he is completely clean. You, Peter, but he's also talking about, it's a plural here, you, disciples, are clean, but not all of you, looking at Judas. So what does that, what does that mean? What, except the feet, we're clean, but we have to accept the feet. Well, he's probably using the example, right? So, so when one would be ritually clean, or if one would just take a bath, and then they would go to see a friend's house or something, then generally they would be clean, except they just walked on those dusty roads. And so all you just need is a little water and clean off the feet, and, and you'd be good. And, and what, what Jesus here seems to be saying is like, listen, if you're ritually clean, if you've been made clean, you don't need to be made clean again. That my cleaning, unlike the ritual cleaning of the temple, unlike the sacrifice that must be done over and over and over and over again, my cleansing sacrifice is once and for all. If you are believing in me, you are clean. You need no other. If, friends, if you are believing in Jesus Christ, there's nothing else you need to do to add to his cleaning work to save yourselves. If you are believing in Jesus Christ, there's no other ritual that needs to take place to be counted as clean before God. That Jesus cleans is not just necessary, but when it happens, when you are washed by the blood of Christ that was shed at the cross, it's final. It's finished. It's complete. You're clean. The third thing, so Jesus' cleansing work is necessary. Jesus' cleaning work is final. And finally, Jesus' cleansing work is becomes, sorry, Jesus' cleansing work becomes effective through faith. The how do we then, so he's saying, you all are clean. How did the disciples, how could Jesus declare them clean? They didn't actually take the bath, right? They didn't take the bath. How did they become clean? If he's already saying, you are clean, but not all of you. And the not all of you is the key there. Right? That there were 11 people in that room with Jesus who were believing in him as the Messiah and believing he was who he said he was. They were believing him and they were going to give their lives to his service. There was one in the room who was not believing. That's Judas. And of course, that's going to become more and more clear as the, the weeks go by. Which ones are clean and which ones are not? The 11 are clean by belief, by faith. The one is not because he has not. Right, so, so the cleaning of the cross is made is made open and available to all who would believe, and then we actually receive that cleansing. Then we are cleansed when and if we believe in Jesus Christ and trust Him for our salvation and trust Him for our share of that inheritance. Jesus' cleansing work is made effective through faith. 
So the first thing that we see in these first 11 verses is this, this idea that what Jesus is doing is washing his feet is symbolizing what he's getting ready to do on the cross. He's given them the context for understanding what just happened at the cross and their new status before God, their new status as his disciples and his followers. And now he, he turns, he turns and he uses the same the same illustration, the same object lesson, the same modeling of cleaning the feet to, to say, and now this is how you go and live. You can't go live like this unless you've been cleansed. So, so don't skip the first part. The necessary for Christians to actually be cleansed before they actually start living and following Jesus. You can't live and follow Jesus, live for Jesus and follow him without first being cleansed, without first being given a new clean heart before God. But those who are given a new clean heart before God are then given some new instructions about how to live and relate to this world. And that's just that Jesus' foot washing then models our call to humble service. Now, one of the mistakes that some people make is in the church and, and some confessing Christians make is when you ask them, who is Jesus? They say, you know, he was just an example. He was an example of love and he was an example of humility and he was an example of, of grace. And so he, he's just someone to learn from. He's a, a good mentor, a good teacher. And, and some people in the church then hear that and go, no, he was like, he's Savior and, and Lord. And, and, and well, actually, he's, he's both, right? He's more than just an example. He's the one that went and died on the cross to cleanse you from your sins. He's your Savior. He is the God King, right? He, so he's more than just an example, but he's not less. In fact, he's the one that, that says that he was an example. Verse 15, for I've given you an example. So he does save us, he does cleanse us, he is our king, but he's also modeling for us what it looks like for us to live in this world. And what he tells us to do is follow his example of washing feet. So if I, your Lord and teacher, verse 14, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do just as I have done. Okay, okay. That's the the command. Do as he's done. Wash feet. Well, what does that mean? Because if you've been with us for a while, you know that that's not a regular practice of Redeemer Fellowship of Kuwait. Is, Is Jesus actually calling us to take off our shoes and wash one another's feet? Well, let me say, I don't think that's what he's saying, but certainly if we were to do that, it wouldn't be sinful or wrong. But I don't think that that captures what Jesus is doing. So some churches, and maybe you've seen these churches, some churches actually have a practice of of regular foot washing as a part of their liturgy. Some churches would consider foot washing the third. So we believe that there's two ordinances, which is baptism and the Lord's Supper. Some churches have a third, which is foot washing, and they they use this passage to to justify that. And so oftentimes on Monday, Thursday, because this was the Thursday, Monday, Thursday, they would they will have as part of their service, they'll, they'll wash feet. Because it says you're supposed to wash feet. So that makes sense, right? It's like, that's what they are asked to do. Well, well, let me tell you why I don't think. I don't think the actual command is for us to go and, and start washing the other's feet. Again, it would be fine. Like, like, it's certainly not a sin to wash it. There is something of humble service in washing another's feet. But here's why I don't think that that's a part of what Jesus is calling us to. If this were a sacrament, an ordinance like baptism and the Lord's Supper, surely it would have showed up somewhere else in Scripture. Like, like nowhere else is this actually given as a command. Whereas baptism shows up several places, the Lord's Supper, the, the Jesus gave it, Paul reaffirms it in 1 Corinthians 11. Like foot washing never comes up again as far as a church practice goes. Where it does come up again is in 1 Timothy 5. It, it notices a woman who is a widow who is one who washes feet, which means that she humbly served and showed hospitality. But that is not in the context of the gathered church in, in worship. So, so it would be very strange for that to be just mentioned once, to be a part of a regular rhythm or liturgy of the church and never show up anywhere else in Scripture as such. Um, a second reason why most of us uh, don't believe that this is something that is, is called the church to do is there's very little evidence that the early church was doing this. 
there are a few uh, kind of convoluted writings very early in, in the church fathers that show some people at least recognizing Jesus' washing of feet. And, and then by the, the fourth century and on, you see more and more growing, and then, then it became more and more popular. But the earliest church and earliest church documents it's not, it does not share the same place as baptism and the Lord's Supper, at least in the way it's spoken of as a church practice. Um, but, but there's another reason for myself, and so that's why I think we are in good standing to say this is not something that everyone should always be doing as a show of humble service. And the real reason, though, is, is I don't think that doing a yearly foot-washing service sufficiently is obedient to what Jesus is actually calling us to. You've probably seen that the video, maybe you've seen some, some churches that, that do this, and again, it's not wrong to do it. But you've seen the guy, and sometimes it's like the bishop guy will come in, and, and he'll, he'll have all of his colorful robes, and he'll sit on his kind of throne-like chair at the front on the altar where nowhere else can go, and, and he'll kind of stoop off of his loft and his pedestal to spend 30 minutes a year kind of washing feet. And he goes back and he puts the same robes on and maybe even a, a hat or holds a staff. And he goes and sits on that same throne-like chair. Like, I don't think, I, I don't get the sense that what Jesus is calling is like, like that 30 minutes of humble service is what he's actually calling us to. But I think what Jesus is calling us to is when I think of what Jesus is calling us to, I think of a, a friend, uh, a, a guy named Eric. He's actually passed away now, but, uh, but he, was, he was this guy in line with us, and uh, a sweet brother. He was a doctor at a, at a, a university of the UAE, had a, a, a very um, prestigious appointment in their medical college there, um, had, was, was very wealthy, had done well for himself financially, um, was a well-honored man, and, and every week... What Dr. Eric got done, when he got done doing his, his professoral, professoral duties there at the university, he would drive out into the middle of the desert where there were these labor camps. And he would connect with believers out there, and he would lead Bible studies with them, and he would care for them. And when they had, when they had needs and physical needs, he would, he would help take care of those, and he would connect them with the church. And he'd, he'd find brothers that were isolated way out in the middle of nowhere, completely disconnected from the church. And he'd, he'd go find them, and he'd, he'd bring them into the body. If you lived a layered kind of, the layered society that we're living in, Dr. Eric was somewhere up here, you know, shakes were here, and he's here. Like, the people he was serving were down here. But his whole life, every single week, his life was focused on stooping down and humbly serve them. When Jesus says, do as I do, be humble and serve others, I don't think of the 30 minutes of foot washing done by the bishop. I think of Eric. I think of his display of humble love and service to people the world would say are below you. And he says, no, 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 these are my brothers. These are my brothers. I'm one with them. That's what I think Jesus is calling us to here. He's not calling us to a particular ritual He's calling us to a lifestyle. That that foot washing should not be something we do once a year to remember Christ's sacrifice, which would be fine. We need to be doing things to remember Christ's sacrifice. But foot washing is the call to live a life that's dedicated to humbly serve. Live a life in this world that's, that's, that's like this and layered and all the statuses. It's to live a life that flips that upside down and, and approaches the world and the church and the people in it, like Christ did. I think that's what foot washing is. I think foot washing is the, the husband that comes home, and instead of claiming his headship, he, he grabs the, the children and goes and plays with them, even changes a dirty diaper on occasion. I know, dads. I know. It is the father that will spend time with his child and, and, and and give up a chance to go out and be honored maybe by others. It's, it's people in the church serving kids' ministry. I know, I said it. Right? Have you ever, have you ever like, oh, I don't want to do kids' ministry because that's like, yeah, they're, they're, I, want, I want something more on. I want to, I want to do something more, more visible, maybe, more meaningful. I've used that word. Like, are we willing to, to serve those who are the least among us? That's what I think humble service looks like. So then how does it relate to foot washing? When, what does the foot washing mean here? Well, well, foot washing is the object lesson. It's providing for us the cultural... The, the cultural context to understand what humility and service is. 
Right? It communicated to first century uh, Jews much more than it com- communicates to us because we don't do foot washing, right? And that, that there are often things in Scripture that have a timeless principle, humble service, that are communicated to us through contextual means. Let me give you one. Not one of you, and I'm not upset about this, but not one of you greeted me today with a holy kiss. I didn't get one kiss from any of you, right? But that's what it says. The scripture says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Why? Well, in that culture, the way that you greeted, even if you went to someone's home and they were a host, they would greet you into their home with a holy kiss. It communicated acceptance. It communicated hospitality. That's why Jesus got mad at one of the Pharisees. You didn't even give me a kiss when I came in, right? So that doesn't mean the same thing for us today, right? That, that cultural kind, and that's, that's foot washing, right? So, so foot washing communicates humble service without having to necessarily replicate that same foot washing. That like a, a holy kiss, what's communicated, the timeless principle of that, humble service, is now displayed in other ways, in the ways that we serve one another. The ways that we serve one another. Now, now, thinking that just doing a 30 minutes of foot washing once a year is, is one way we can kind of miss this, this passage, right? But, but there's another way we kind of miss this passage, is, is assuming that to do what Jesus did is to humble serve, humbly serve like Jesus did, which means we take the, the wrong view and understanding that we can actually save others. That somehow he's given us the authority to clean others, right? We want, we want to be careful of that too, He shows us what humble service is. Ultimately, his humble service to us was dying, taking on our shame and our sin and dying a death that we deserve to die so that we could be saved. That that was his humble service. We can't die for others. We can't clean others. We, We don't have that authority. And one of the places where we can mess up as believers is we take on the weight and burden of trying to save others that we have no authority and ability to save. And so we want to be very careful to understand what Jesus was showing us was how to humbly serve and interact with the world we're in. What he's not showing us is that we have the authority to go save. Parents, you don't have the authority to save your children. You want to be speaking the gospel to your children. You want to be modeling the gospel to your children. You can't save your children. Only God can. We can't save our friends. We can't save our family. We can't save the others that are coming into this church. We can't save our coworkers. We're not called to. What we're called to do is humbly serve. And part of that humble service, part of that humble service may be humbling ourselves, taking on the shame of speaking our affections and devotions of Christ and declaring the gospel to those who may reject us because of it. Now, I don't think you can say foot washing equals evangelism. That would be, that would be a wrong use of this scripture. Um, but clearly Jesus lands where he ends this conversation about foot washing is in the sense of inviting others to follow him. As he moves on to the end, he's, he's saying, I'm not, I'm not speaking to all of you, right? Because again, he knows that, that Judas is going to betray him. I have no those I have chosen, but the scripture must be fulfilled. The one who eats bread has raised his heel against me. I'm telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he, as the Messiah. Verse 20, Truly I tell you, whoever receives anyone I send receives me, and the one who receives me receives whom, uh, him who, I, who sent me. So otherwise, what Jesus is saying is, the way that we as people get to God is by receiving him. The Father has sent him, and the way that we access God, and in the same way, or at least a similar way, Jesus is now sending us. And if people receive us, they receive Jesus, so if we receive God. Right? So does that mean that this has to be our friends? No. No, no, no. When we receive Jesus, what are we receiving? We're receiving his teaching. We're receiving the truth. We're we're receiving light. And so when he sends us, what he sends us to do is to speak truth and to speak light, to proclaim the gospel to others. And those who receive that message that we're speaking, and those who also believe, have now, in their belief in the message of Christ, been cleansed and become one of his people. 
that whatever foot washing is, it cannot be exclusively the speaking forth of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The fact that we are, are needy and helpless, that, that, that we are, are rebellious sinners against God who deserve the worst punishment, but that Jesus came to this earth and took that punishment upon himself, in so doing, cleansed us from our unrighteousness, cleansed us from our impurities. He rose again, inviting us into that same eternal life, and he will come again to gather us into it. Like, that's the message that we, we speak, and that's the message that can save. It's not us that save but we do have a message that saves. And would we be willing, friends, would we be willing to bring shame upon ourselves to serve someone else by speaking the message of life? Can we call ourselves humble servants if we would look at someone we know does not know Jesus, knowing that we have the fame to eternal life and for our own honor and our own status, maybe our own job, we would refuse to speak that message to them? Well, that wouldn't be service. Right? That, what we get modeled for us is a humble and sacrificial service, one who's willing to give up everything so that we could have everything. Now he's calling us to give up everything so others can have everything. We have received we have received grace, and now we have the chance to go and communicate and proclaim grace. There's a, there's a great story of a, a woman named Hildy, Hildy Back. Um, she, was a, she was very young at the time of the, the Holocaust in, in Germany, and, and she escaped. She was a Jewish woman, and she escaped because a random stranger brought her some money, which was enough to help her flee the country and get into Sweden. And it was that gift, that gracious gift from a random stranger that got her into Sweden. And then when she was living in Sweden, she wanted to try to figure out a way that she could give back. And so she was a teacher. She didn't have a lot of money. So she took the extra money she had and she sent it to, to Kenya where there was a, a man named Chris Mburu. And, and because of Hilda Back's response of giving that money to this this group in, in Kenya that, that took that money and funded Chris Mburu's education, that he ended up going and, and getting a law degree from Harvard. Harvard's a, a very prestigious school in the United States, and then he took that law degree, and then he realized that he had received a grace, a gift of grace that, that he didn't deserve, and so then he went back and established the Hilda Back Foundation and, and educated thousands of others. Each of those stories, Hilda and, and Chris, what what, what would they did they responded to a particular gift of grace? That something was modeled for them, and then they realized the graciousness and the service in it, and they went and did likewise. Now, how much more? That's just some education, which is great, right? We need that. But like how much more when someone has given us the gift of new life, has given us entire life, he, he died for us, how much more in receiving of that gift ourselves should turn around and try to, try to pass that gift on to others? As Jesus has humbly served us, so too now we are called to go out and humbly serve.